Hi everyone, welcome to Little Wicket Railway. I'm Rob and in this video we're talking power, wiring and electrics, specifically for DCC layouts. But before we get stuck in, thank you to everyone who's subscribed to the channel recently. I hope you're enjoying the content, but the analytics tell me that the vast majority of you watching this video won't be subscribers and that's fine, there's absolutely no pressure, but it is totally free. And if you turn on notifications, then you'll never miss a video. Plus, I'll really appreciate it because it helps the channel to grow. But now, on to power and wiring. And whilst this video might be talking about powering a DCC layout because my layout is digital, many of the concepts will be applicable to analog layouts too. So maybe stick around even if you're not a DCC user at the moment. So let's go back to basics. At its simplest, a DCC layout will have a command station, which is a fancy DCC name for what most of us would call a controller, something like the Hornby Select or the DCC XTSB1. There are loads of options out there on the market, but whatever system you use, as a bare minimum, it will have two wires coming out of it that connect your command station to your track, and these are called the DCC bus wires. They not only carry the power for your locos, but also the data that communicates with the decoders. And these could be decoders that are in the locos moving on the rails or stationary decoders placed around your layout that can control accessories such as points or signals. A simple DCC layout, say a single length of track, might have the DCC bus connecting directly to the track and that's all you need. Whereas for a larger layout, you might want to connect the DCC bus to the track in multiple places. And these shorter wires that link the track to the bus are called dropper wires or feeder wires. And you can see my dropper wires here on the new stretch of track ready to be connected to the DCC bus that I haven't installed yet. The droppers are soldered to the underside of the rails and they pass through a small hole in the baseboard. I use blue and white wires for my DCC wiring. Why not red and black? Well, personally, I associate red and black with a DC power supply. Red is the positive and black is ground. So I'm reserving those colors for a five volt or 12 volt DC bus that I'll also be having running around the layout to power things like lighting. A DCC signal doesn't have polarity, which is why the outputs are often referred to as A and B rather than positive and negative. So I use blue and white for my DCC wires, but you can choose whichever colors you want. But whatever colors you go with, it's important that these are consistently connected to the rails. If a loco is going forward around my layout, then white is always the right rail because white rhymes with right and blue is always the left rail because blue and left both have four letters. That's important because if you mix them up, then you'll get a short circuit. I put dropper wires on each piece of track, which means I'm not relying on the metal rail joiners or the fish plates to carry the power and data signals between sections of track and should in theory mean greater reliability. The recommendation is that you should have droppers every few feet on your layout to guarantee a reliable connection at every point on the rails. And that's the basics on how to connect your track to the DCC command station. Now let's talk about wires because there are some things you need to consider when selecting the type of wire you'll be using for your DCC bus. My go-to resource for this kind of information is dccwiki.com. They've got pages dedicated to wiring and this handy table which shows you the size of wires you should be using. And that depends on how large your layout is and what scale models you're using. And I'll put a link to that page in the video description below. Talking about wire size can be a bit confusing because sometimes it's measured in millimeters square, sometimes American wire gauge or AWG, sometimes standard wire gauge and sometimes British wire gauge. American wire gauge seems to be quite common so that's what I'm going to use in this video. The confusing thing with AWG though is that the smaller number actually means a thicker wire. For example, 14 AWG is bigger than 22 AWG. And you can think of your wiring system a bit like a traffic network with the size of the wire being the size of the road and the amount of traffic being the current draw. So you want a motorway coming out of your command station because that can handle a lot of traffic. Then as the bus feeds different parts of the layout, it breaks off into A roads and then the dropper wires are like single track lanes or driveways that connect to the rails and they don't see much traffic. If your wire isn't big enough for all your traffic, then you get a traffic jam. Or in the case of wiring, too many amps going through a wire that's too small creates heat and in the worst case scenario could be a fire risk. The length of your wires is important because whilst wires are really good conductors, they do have a resistance and this can cause the voltage to drop across the length of the wire. 
and as an extreme example, 100 meters of 22 AWG wire could have around seven ohms of resistance. So if you ran one amp through it, you'd lose seven volts between the start and the end. And that's a massive drop. If you ran five amps along that wire, then you'd generate 175 watts of power, which would be mostly heat. And again, that's not ideal. Most people won't have wiring that long, but that's why bus length is a factor when choosing which wire to use. The table suggests that for 00 scale, the main bus wire should be 12 to 14 AWG, and the shorter feeder wires should be 18 to 22 AWG. Wires can also be single core with a solid wire running through it, or multi-strand where a number of smaller wires are bunched together to create the core. Multi-stranded wire tends to be more flexible and often more resistant to breaking, which makes them a better choice for routing through tight spaces, and that's why I use them on the railway. The other thing to consider is the outer covering. The core of these two wires is identical, but this one is much thicker and less bendy because it's got a plastic outer coating, whereas this one has a silicon coating, which makes it far more flexible and more discreet, so better for dropper wires. Right, so we've got our thicker bus wires and our smaller dropper wires, but how do we connect them together? Well, there are a few different options, but I'll share with you the two options that I've used before. On my first layout, I used Scotch lock style connectors, sometimes known as suitcase connectors. You place them over your bus wire and your dropper wire goes into the little slot on the side. Then you push the metal part down with a pair of pliers. It cuts into the bus wire and connects it to the dropper. And then it's got this little flap that closes over the top. So I was having a look through the bits of wiring I had left over from the first layout to see whether I had any of the Scotch lock style connectors around that I could show you. And I actually found this bit of wire that had both types attached to it. And I assume this was just my little test to see which one I preferred. So this would have been the DCC bus wire. And this is the first type of connector. So we can flip it open and you can see that's where the dropper wire goes in. Then you get some pliers and pinch the metal clip down. And then you flip that over to keep it all neat and tidy. But that's it. Once it's on, it's on. This style is slightly different. It's got a spade connector on it. So that would be your dropper wire. And then this clips onto your bus wire and we can actually open it up and have a look inside. That's how it's cut into the DCC bus wire. Um, so maybe a slightly better option because you can actually remove the dropper. But there we go, the two styles of Scotch lock connector. I used them on my first layout and they were very reliable. It's easy to add a dropper mid bus wire and they're quite cheap. But personally, I didn't like that I couldn't see the connection that had been made as it's all hidden inside the clip. And once they're on, they're pretty difficult to get off. On the new layout, I've switched to using these Wago style connectors. They have little lever clamps that hold the wires in place. The bus wires enter here and exit here. Then your droppers can be connected in the middle. And they come in a variety of sizes. So if you had a five-way connector, you can have three droppers coming off at the same time. And because they just flip open and closed, if you need to take a piece of track up for any reason, then it's easy to remove the dropper from the clip. They're designed for home electrics, so can handle voltages and currents far higher than you'd ever have on a railway. They can just be glued or taped to the underside of your baseboard, or I've 3D printed holders for them which screw in. The downside is that they're more expensive, but currently these are my preferred way of connecting the droppers to the bus wires. And I'm sure there are other options for connecting dropper wires. I know that some people swear by soldering the connections. Let me know your methods in the comments. We've pretty much covered the basics of wiring a DCC layout. Now we're gonna get a bit more advanced. Let's talk power districts and power boosters. Imagine a layout where I've got a main line and coming off of it, I've got a branch line. Let's say I'm shunting on the branch line and have a derailment that causes a short circuit. The short circuit protection on the command station should kick in and cut the power to the layout. Ideally though, I don't want something that's happened on the branch line to cause everything on the rest of the layout to suddenly stop. But if I only had one power district, then that's what would happen. However, if I made the branch line its own power district, electrically isolated from the rest of the layout with its own short circuit protection, then I could have a short circuit on the branch line and only the branch line would shut down. Everything else would continue running as normal. So how do we do that? Well, first of all, we need to put an electrical brake in the track using insulated plastic rail joiners. I'd put them down here at the beginning of the branch line where it splits away from the main line. Then we effectively need to split the DCC bus. One goes to the main line and one goes to the branch line and we'll give each their own short circuit protection. And there are various options for putting in short circuit detection and protection. 
Merg produce these modules that you can build yourself. And here's another example, the NCE EB1 circuit breaker. And for most of these short circuit detection devices, it's possible to configure how sensitive they are. Now, if you have a short on the branch, then the main line can continue and vice versa. If something shorts on the main line, then the branch line operations can continue. If you've got DCC accessory decoders on your layout, for example, controlling points, then it can often be useful to consider these as a separate power district so that if you have a short circuit somewhere that shuts down the trap power, then you can still operate your points and your signals. And that's particularly useful if the short was caused by forgetting to throw a point before running a train over it. And there's a chance you can throw the point to fix the issue. My new layout will have four track power districts plus one for the accessory decoders. And one of these power districts will be the staging. This area has more track than the rest of the layout combined. And it's gonna have a lot of locos in it, which means it will probably draw more current than the other power districts put together. And for that reason, as well as having its own power district, it'll also have a dedicated booster power supply. But what's a booster? Well, it's a unit that takes the signal sent out by the command station, creates an exact copy and combines it with a new separate power supply, therefore boosting the power available to that section of the layout. Again, there are various booster options available depending on the systems you're using to control your layout, but generally it's a case of the original DCC signal goes in and a boosted signal comes out. And boosters often have their own short circuit protection built in, so you've got your power district already sorted. You just need to make sure that the booster is wired to the rails in the same way as the command station. The final thing on my layout that makes things a little bit more complicated are the block occupancy current detectors. For example, my staging is split into different blocks of track and at each end you can see I've used plastic fish plates to isolate it from the rest of the layout. I want to be able to tell if anything is occupying that block and the way I do it is by using sensors which can detect current draw. This means that the power supply connected to all the droppers in this block needs to pass through the current detector first. You can see here that the DCC bus comes to a power distribution board, which takes the main DCC bus and splits it out for each block. And the white wires then pass through the current detectors before heading down to the dropper wires for the block. So using the traffic analogy again, if the DCC bus is the motorway and the dropper wires to the track are like single track lanes or driveways, then these bits splitting off will be like the main roads that go between the motorway and the droppers, and each main road has a block occupancy current sensor. To make this process of distributing power easier, there are some products on the market that can help. I've previously used these boards from Eve Model, but a couple of companies have been kind enough to send me some examples of what they offer. These are from a company called Black Pair Models, and I owe them an apology because they sent these over to me absolutely ages ago. They do a range of power distribution boards with varying numbers of connections, some with solder pads and some with screw terminals. The nice thing is that they come with standoffs and screws so they can be easily mounted to a baseboard. And the solder pad versions also have holes pre-drilled for the supplied cable ties to pass through and keep everything nice and tidy. I'll put a link to these down in the description below. And Model Rail Electrics sent me these to have a look at. They do a range of power distribution boards with four, six and 10 screw terminal connectors. Again, with the pre-drilled screw holes for mounting. They also do boards that you can use for your dropper wire. So an alternative to the suitcase and Wago connectors if you prefer screw terminals. You can bolt by these in packs of 10, 50 and 100 as well. Again, I'll drop their contact details in the description. And you don't have to use these for DCC connections. They'd work just as well on an analog layout or for a five, 12 volt power bus for your lighting, for example. Anyway, some options there for power distributions, and it's great to see products like these being developed to make life easier for us modelers. So thanks once again to Black Pair Models and Model Rail Electrics for sending those in for me to take a look at. Another quick tip for when you're connecting wires to screw terminals is to crimp a ferrule onto the end of the wire. These keep all the strands together and give the screw in the terminal something chunky to grip onto. You'll need a ferrule crimper. You can get these from Amazon and they usually come with a variety of different size ferrules to put on the end of your wires. I'll put an affiliate link to one of these and some other useful tools in the video description. The final couple of things I've left until last because they're a bit technical and debated practices. Firstly, should you twist your bus wires? There's a school of thought that says you should twist your bus wires together, and they usually recommend a few twists every foot. But the benefits are debated, and it's really only something to consider for longer runs of wire. The pros of twisting are considered to be that it lowers inductance of the bus, it's neater, and it results in cleaner data by reducing crosstalk and false signals. 
However, these benefits can largely be achieved by keeping bus wires close together, and you can do that using cable tires keeping them side by side. Secondly, should you terminate your DCC bus? Generally, when your DCC bus comes to an end, most likely at the final set of track feeders, you don't need to do anything. But there is a suggestion that you should terminate your bus using an RC terminator or a snubber. A snubber is essentially just a capacitor and a resistor between the ends of the bus wires and the theory is that it reduces any ringing or reflections within the wiring system that could distort the DCC signal. However, most modern decoders are sophisticated enough to deal with these issues internally. You can buy snubbers or you can even make them yourself, but unless you've got a good reason to try adding them, such as decoders behaving erratically, then I would say they're probably not necessary for most model railways. As an aside, I also play around with intelligent stage and disco lighting. The movements of the lighting fixtures are controlled by a communication protocol called DMX in a similar way to decoders being controlled by DCC. And I've had it where some of my lighting fixtures would just be completely out of control, doing their own thing and having their own mini disco, unless the DMX line was terminated with a snubber and then they behaved perfectly. And obviously we're talking about longer runs of wire here, higher voltages and currents, so quite different to model railways, but it was quite incredible to see what difference a snubber made in that scenario. Presumably whatever's receiving and decoding the signals in a disco light isn't as sophisticated as the decoders in our locos. Anyway, do you twist and snub on your railway? Let me know in the comments. So there we go. I think we've touched on most things power related for a DCC layout. Each layout is going to be different, but hopefully you've seen how planning your wiring is almost as important as track planning. Let me know in the comments if you think I've missed something important or you've got a tip to share. Every day is a school day, so I'm sure there's still lots for me to learn. Generally, model railway electrics are pretty safe and low risk, but it is still electricity and some of those bigger power supplies can put out a lot of current. So take care. And if you're not sure what you're doing, then maybe ask someone who does to help. A massive thank you to all the YouTube members and patrons for your support. It's very much appreciated and your names will be up on the screen now. If you've enjoyed this video, then please give it a like and subscribe to the channel for lots more model railway content. That's about it for this video. Thanks for watching and I'll hopefully see you again soon.